so much up here. But I have to 159, I know that, so. Uh, you know, stories about dads are hard to find. They really are, they're hard to, because most of them want to like make dad look really bad, and they want to make dad look really bad. So uh, I went to Old Faithful here, Irma Bombeck, and uh, I'm going to read this for you here this morning, and we've got a couple ladies that are going to help us. Uh, you know, it looks like they're ready, so I'll let you know. And, okay, they're ready, they're ready. Uh, this, Irma Bombeck wrote this. It was a story of God creating the father, you know, the, you know, the people who are fathers. When the good Lord was creating fathers, he started with a tall frame. Obviously, I came from the last batch. <laughs> And a female angel nearby said, what kind of father is that? If you're going to make children so close to the ground, why have you put fathers up so high? He won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling, tuck a child in bed without bending, or even kiss a child without a lot of stooping. And God smiled and said, yes, but if I make him child size, who would children then have to look up to? And when God made the father's hands, they were large and sinewy. And the angel shook her head sadly and said, Do you know what you're doing? Large hands are clumsy. They can't manage diaper pins and small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. And God smiled and said, I know, but they're large enough to hold everything a small boy empties from his pockets at the end of the day, yet small enough to cup a child's face in his hands. And then God molded long, slim legs and broad shoulders. And the angel nearly had a heart attack. Boy, this is the end of the week, all right, she thought. Do you realize you have just made a father without a lap? How is he going to pull a child close to him without the kid falling between his legs? And God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap. A father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled, balance on the bicycle, and hold a sleepy head on the way home from the circus. God was in the middle of creating two of the largest feet anyone had ever seen. <laughs> this is where I know I came into the batch. When the angel could contain herself no longer. That's not fair. Do you honestly think those large boats are going to dig out of bed early in the morning when the baby cries? Or walk through a small birthday party without crushing at least three of his guests? And God smiled and said, they'll work, you'll see. They'll support a small child who wants to ride a horse to Banbury Cross, or scare off mice at the suburb cabin, or display his shoes that will be a challenge to fill. God worked throughout the night, giving the father few words, but a firm, authoritative voice, eyes that saw everything, but remained calm and tolerant. Finally, Almost as an afterthought, he added tears. Then he turned to the angel and said, Now you are satisfied that he can love as much as a mother. So I just thought that was kind of pretty. Kind of, I like that. So God made you men the way you are. Not just in the fatherly role, but he made you the way, the type of father that you are. And I want you to celebrate that and encourage that. We don't have a gift of clumsy hands or big feet for you, but we do have a gift for you, a devotional uh, for the fathers. Uh, and the ladies are racing around now, so thank you, volunteers. I appreciate that. Uh, a gift for the fathers. It's a devotional, just five minutes a day with the Lord, uh, as well as a, a gift to Bethy's. So enjoy some ice cream or a round of mini golf or, or whatever you like there. But thank you, dads, for being with us and for those who are like fathers as well. I feel like... Uh, I have lots and lots of kids as I've served through several churches and maybe, you know, Sunday school teachers, you guys know that we have lots of kids, don't we? We have our own kids and then we have lots and lots of kids. And, uh, so it's good. It's good. But let's turn now in our study to uh, Exodus chapter 40. This morning we're going to be finishing up uh, our study of the book of Exodus. It, it has not been a verse by verse, chapter by chapter study, but I hope and pray that you have seen the theme of what God is doing here, is that you know, he is helping us to break through uh, from bondage into freedom, into liberty, and that he has given us his holy name, and now he is drawing us into his holy place. And it's hard to think that, as you, as you turn there, it's, it's hard to think that in the life of Israel, you know, you, could, you and I could sit down and we could read from Genesis 
and then get into Exodus and read the entire book of Exodus in probably just a few hours. But for them, it was a year. A year ago, they had been set out of uh, Egypt. A year ago, they had turned from that. And so their lives were completely different, completely turned upside down. And so I want to begin in Exodus 34. I love this passage in the scripture. I underline it with red pen. It, it blesses my heart, and I, I would encourage you to underline it or highlight it or something and just turn back to it from time to time. Beginning in verse 34, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but I want you to catch that. Then... The cloud, the same cloud, the pillar that had brought them forth from Egypt, had now moved in and covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In case you wondered what it was like in the house where the glory of the Lord is, it says right in verse 35, Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The weight and the presence of God was so heavy in that place that you could just not walk into it. You just don't come haphazardly into the presence of the Lord. But it was so heavy over the tabernacle that morning. It was so heavy. Uh, I'm reminded of a story that uh, I had heard. There was this revival going on down. This is told to me as a true story. I share it as a true story. There was a revival going on uh, down in South America. It was in a little tabernacle tent. Not tent, but small building similar to this size and shape. One room type thing. And they said, God's spirit is pouring out. you just you got to go there and find out what's going on. So this person had traveled down to this little South American village, and he was down, and he, sure enough, he could see the tabernacle up on the hill where people went to worship, and they did their services at night. So they were there during the day, and they were waiting. Well, lo and behold, it got around a little bit after dinner, and he looked up just to see if people were gathering, and he said, they panicked. The place was on fire. And they didn't know what to do. They panicked. So as they're looking there, they, it, it was like you could even see the flames coming out of the window. This is told to me as a true story. And so everybody started running up the hill. And, and they're th he's thinking, where's the buckets? Where's the, you know, come put this thing out, you know? But everybody goes running up the hill. And as they were getting up to the tabernacle, the doors were open. People were running in. And as they were running in, they were immediately slain by the Spirit. They just fell because it wasn't a physical fire. It was the fire of God that was physically manifesting itself in the tabernacle. And he said, it was funny because I went running in like to everybody else. It was like, you know, we just went running in. And I'm tripping over people that are lying there in prayer and in tongues and falling. And, and that's, that's how heavy the spirit must have been on the tabernacle that day with Moses. He could not even enter it because of the glory of God. Had filled, and we're going to talk about that filled again. Beginning in verse, or uh, continuing in verse 36. Throughout all their journeys, throughout all their journeys, Alan Cole writes, to speak of a journey is to look for an arrival. And I think that, that this is an arrival point for them. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day it was taken up. And that word whenever, it's just, you know, they had learned and, and we are learning to trust God's provision, to trust God's providence, to trust God's timing. We don't want to get ahead, lag behind, or go around the will and the ways of God. Because as he marches on that journey through the desert, through the difficulties of our life, he will get to the destination. But if we march ahead, march around, march behind, march all over the place, we're going to be staying in the desert. Right? I want to be with God. I want to be united with God. I want to be following his will and his ways. Verse 38, for throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel. In the sight of all the house of Israel. And so now we understand that the, the, the divisions of the tribes of Israel as they marched out, it wasn't just three tribes on this side, three tribes on this side, three tribes on this side, just so that they could be marched out as a military. But God wanted them to see this. He didn't want people way in the back not to be able to see. He didn't want people way in the front not to be able to see. He wanted everybody to have a personal experience, a personal vision of what God was doing in the midst. 
Isn't that powerful? And I, and I pray and hope that you get that as well. Well, let's give a little bit of detail here. So I want you to remember that, that there's something I wrote down in my notes, and I, and I encourage you to grab this. We do not, now isn't that, first off, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Like, isn't that why we come to church? I, I hope you don't come to church just because of all the side things and, and the, the fun stories. And I hope you come to church because you want that kind of experience. But the thing about that is, is that we don't get chapter 40 without verses 20 through 40. Right? Like, like we don't think about that. I think so many times we get into these, re these revival movements, and, and I hear it, and, and, and God bless the people that are in it, and I hope they see it. There are so many people caught up into this, we want to see a revival of God. We want to see a fresh awakening of God. Well, that requires 20 through 40. That requires chapter 20 through 40. You don't just show up and all of a sudden God's manifest presence is there. Wow. But there's a lot that goes into that. Consider what the Israelites had gone through over the past 400 years. They were slaves. They were treated like rabble in a foreign country that was not their own. They struggled. They scrimped. They had taskmasters over them. But they cried out to God. They cried out to God. They didn't complain. Well, they probably did. But the emphasis wasn't that they complained to one another. More so that they cried out to God. Amen. God, help us. Deliver us. We're going to get to that word, Phil. You're going you're to be blessed. Because in that time, the Israelites were empty. They were empty. And they needed to be filled. And, and so when we get to that, I, I pray you're blessed. So they had, in, in this chapters 20 through 40, the Israelites and the rabble came out of 400 years of slavery. 400 years. I don't know what that would do to a nation. I can't even imagine. Colonial slavery just about destroyed an entire genre, a group of people in this, in this country, I don't know what 400 years of that would do. Did they even remember their own history, their, their own culture? Did they remember their own family recipes, things like that? But they came out of that almost as blank slates, empty, needing to be filled. And they had personally encountered the God who saved them. They had personally encountered the God who saved them, and they heard his voice. Man, I don't know if you've ever heard the, the voice of God. I encourage you to pray. It, it doesn't have to, like, rattle your windows. It doesn't have to do, you, it can even happen. It happened for me in, in just a quiet setting by myself. Heard the voice of God just, man, change me. And in chapters 20 through 40, how many people like the law in the Bible? How many people like the law, right? Because we're getting ready to read Leviticus. Are you excited about the law? Yay! That's like the most skipped over book in the Bible, just so you know, the book of Leviticus. It's crazy. But we love justice, don't we? You don't get justice without the law, folks. And so when we look at these things, these laws, they're actually very, very simple. If, if a nation could live by these codes, we wouldn't have the volumes and volumes and tones of laws that we have in our books. We wouldn't have to pay legislators to meet year-round to do these kinds of things. These are the commandments. It's not just the ten that we had looked at. Again, that was the chapter page for the rest of the book. These were laws concerning how to govern yourself. You were a slave. Somebody told you when to get up and when to lie down. They told you what to eat and what not to eat. They told you what work to do and what not work to do. They told you how to treat others and do those kinds of things. Now God is saying, I want you to govern yourself according to my principles. I want you to learn how to be a man in this kingdom. I want you to learn how to be a woman in this kingdom. I want you to learn how to be a proper parent, how to be a proper neighbor. And so there are laws concerning slavery, which is... Biblical slavery, not colonial slavery, okay? And we can get into that another time. There were laws concerning personal injury. There were laws concerning theft and property damage. Laws concerning dishonesty and immorality. Laws concerning civil and religious obligations. Laws concerning Sabbaths and feasts. It's very simple stuff. I mean, you don't even have to be a Christian to say, you know what, this is, real, this is good government. And so you, we should want to embrace these things rather than taking and pushing them out of our lives and living empty lives. Living like slaves all over again. We have no laws to govern ourselves. And so during this process, they received his instructions also for the tabernacle's construction. 
That's a big project. I don't know if you've ever tried to build a bathroom or not. <laughs> That's a big project to build the entire tabernacle of God and how to properly use the tabernacle. The usage was really important to God because we were meeting a holy God there. Amen. And then also they heard his name from his lips. Wow. To hear his name from his lips. The one who saved them. The one who loved them. The one who, who carried them out of bondage and slavery. And so somewhere in the midst of all this, Moses is talking to the people. It says in chapter 24, Moses came and recounted to all the people the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice. One voice. There was unity on this. Not necessarily uniformity. We didn't all have to stand at the same time, sit at the same time, wear the same clothes. But there was unity on this, that this is good law. This is good. We'll embrace this. It says that the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. This just makes sense to live like this. There's no law against love. There's no law against those types of things. This is good. This makes sense. We're empty. We came out of slavery. We're empty. We need to be filled with something. We need to be able to learn how to self-govern. And your law does that, God. So thank you. And they received it. So again, going back to that theme, we do not get chapter 40, verses 34 through 38 without 20 through 40. We have to go through those experiences. We have to learn to walk with God, sometimes in the desert. We have to learn to embrace our emptiness apart from Him. I'm, I'm learning to enjoy humility. This, this year, God, I don't know what it is. He just, <laughs> I thought I was pretty humble. God said, you're humble, you're just not enjoying it. <laughs> so this year, I'm going to make you enjoy it. I hope you don't go through that. <laughs> but you're going to have to, because your walk is different than my walk. Megan, your walk is different than my walk. God's got his own path through, he's got his own hole to put before you. And you have to embrace it, you have to walk through that. The same as Jeff, the same for you. Your walk is different than my walk. I can't walk it for you. I can walk it with you, but I can't walk it for you. And so we have to go through those processes. And what does it take? What did it take for them to get through that year? What did it, would it take for them to get through that time period? It took a covenant God. It took a covenant God, and this is the God that we've been talking about since way back in, in Genesis chapter 12. It took a covenant God who said, I will not just create you, I will care for you. I will be there for you. I will never leave you or forsake you. If I say that I'm going to do something for you, I'll do it. If I ask you to do it, I'll equip you. It took a covenant God. This is a God who is so active and so personal and so present in our lives that he calls himself Jehovah. I am that I am. Well, God, what if I need this? I'm in. Well, God, I'm not really sure where to go. Where do I find directions? I'm in. God is that present with it. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that encouraging to know that Jesus Christ is right there for us? I'm sorry, I thought I heard amen. Go ahead. Okay, just making sure. It took a covenant God. It takes a covenant God. It also takes a covenant community. So God's job is to be the covenant God. That's his God. Uh, that's his job. He does that very well, I think. Our role as the church, capital C Church, not just the body that's gathered here today, is to be that covenant community. That covenant community, just like in Exodus 24, that says, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. We'll do those things. We'll live in community together. You have taught us by your law in just, in just 19 and a half short chapters You've taught us how to treat each other, how to live well with each other, how to care for each other, how to attend to your presence in the tabernacle. That's really not that bad, is it? 20 chapters? You could read 20 chapters if, if you could live by that. You could have a blessed life. It takes a commitment, a full commitment, to health and growth. It just, it's flat out, guys. It takes a full commitment to health and growth. You can't be here for any other reason. You cannot be in this building for any other reason. If you're in this building for any other reason, it's sin. Well, I got, a few, I, got, I got some attention there. If you're in this building for any other reason, it's just sin. I'm sorry. If you're here because, because it solely makes you feel good and you only take and you, you're, you're building and you're puffing up your own kingdom, that's sin. 
If you're here because of what you get out of this, that's not why God has called you here. He's called you here to pour into you and for you to pour into others. And through that, he'll bless us and build us up. Amen? Amen. That's scary thought, isn't it? Churches and communities, I wrote this down, this is, churches and communities can survive with less than best in most things, but not in the God they serve or the community they live in. I think that's really what the book of Exodus is about. Churches and communities can survive with less than best in most things, but not in the God they serve or the community that they live in. And the perfect example is look at two nations at the beginning of the book of Exodus and two nations at the end of the book of Exodus. Think about that. Two nations at the beginning of the book of Exodus. You had Egypt and you had Israel. Egypt, the best. They were at the zenith of their powers. They, they, the, the, the pyramids were old news to them. They had already built that and moved on to bigger things. Isn't that crazy? That, that they had the most powerful army in the world. They had the most, everything that they wanted, perfumes, foods, everything. It was amazing. And the Israelites were living like slaves. But they were in community together. They, were, they, they held to each other. They cried out to the Lord together. They didn't have the best foods to eat, did they? They didn't have the best army to fight off anybody, did they? They were able to survive with less than best because they were committed to the covenant God whom they cried out to, who would not disappoint, like the Egyptian gods did. The Egyptian gods, who, those were less than best. <laughs> the Egyptian gods were less than, and that's why they were destroyed like that, by the very hand of God. The Egyptian community crumbled, and, and this is extra biblical, but you can look at actual biblical accounts. This period is known as the Hyksos period, H-Y-K-S-O-S. The Hyksos period, you can look it up later on, trust me, I'm not lying to you. And, and the Hyksos period was, uh, it's known as there was foreign people who came in and actually ran the country of Egypt. This is documented in their stuff, not our stuff. And when they left, around the time of Amenhotep, when they left, Egypt's economy, Egypt's culture, everything just tumbled downhill. And this is what allowed the Assyrians to rise up as a new power. Because they, they had less than best in what really, really mattered. And that was a God who saved, a covenant God who saved, and a committed community about them. So I want to tell you before anything, you want to make it serve a covenant God. Get involved and be a part of the committed community. Committed community? Yes, yeah, there. <laughs> I get ahead of myself sometimes. I want to talk about this word filled. I want to talk about this word. I, we need to have this word filled, okay? So look with me again at Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. And, and he, he says it in 34 and in 35. Then the cloud of the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord, filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He used that word filled two times within two sentences. It must be something. See, whenever I see things like that when I'm doing word studies, if I see something occurring more than once in such a short period of time, God is making a point, and it drove me to look up. What does this word mean, filled? What does it mean, filled? The, the original Hebrew word is uh, M-A-L-E, Mele, even though it looks like male, it's M-A-L-E. It means filled, finished, accomplished. Filled, finished, accomplished. So, so God looked down on his temple and made sense, right? It's, it's all done, I can move in now, right? But it also means placed, replenished, and here it is, ready? Satiated, quenched. Like it is just so wet, it's dripping. If it was moisture, it would be running down the walls like, like you know, sweat in the summer. It's just satiated. Satiated. God's glory filled the temple. That's why Moses, in his sinful self, in his broken self, he couldn't enter the temple. There was no room left. There was no room left. It was filled with the glory of God. And it reminds me, this word filled reminds me of two other passages in Scripture I want to read to you. One we've read already, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground. Remember this, right? Then the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. He, what? He filled into his nostrils the breath of life, 
And man became, as in he wasn't before, man became a living being. Right? Man was dry. He was empty. He was just the clay of the, of the earth. The dust of the earth. Now, he was animated. He could get up. He could walk around. He could do the same things that animals could do. But he was not living until the breath of life filled him. This morning, I don't know where you're at. You might be at the beginning of the, the desert. And you're a slave coming out of bondage. You don't even know you're free yet. You're, just, you're stuck in those old lifestyle habits. And you're empty and you're dry. God wants to get you to the other side of the desert. Amen. It's going to take 20 chapters to get through it. <laughs> You're going to have to change your lifestyle. You're going to have to start living by his law. You're going to have to start receiving his presence. You're going to have to start listening for his, his words from his own lips. But he wants to fill you. He wants to fill you so much that there's no room for anything else in there. Right? There's no room for sin. There's no room for pride. There's no room for shame, fear, doubt. There's no room for anything. I'm just filled. I'm a living being with God Almighty inside of me. Isn't that powerful? Could you receive that this morning? Another time is Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, the disciples had just watched Jesus die. They were scattered in fear. They didn't know what to do. They were hiding in the upper room, probably an enclosed area, big room, maybe the size of this, I don't know, like 120 of them. That'd be pretty good point, because we can hold about 120 here. Scared, not sure what to do. And God has a plan for them. You get out of this little room, go out there and tell everybody about me. But I just saw what they did to you. What are they going to do to me? And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus speaking to them, he says, But you will receive power when I come upon you. When I fill you, when I fill you, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the lowest parts of the earth. Disciple, whoever you are, wherever you are, beloved of Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God fills you, there's no room for fear, is there? There's no room for shame. There's no room for pride. Just let him in. Take him in. You, you'll be a walking, witnessing, and in your own way, we're not going to all be Billy Grahams and stuff like that, but you will be sharing Jesus Christ if you just let God fill you. I, I spent so many years doing church uh, growth and church health and we studied revival movements, all this kind of stuff. And Well, if we just learn to pray like the Welsh, if we just learn to do this like the English, if we just learn, you know what? You know what happened in the Bible? They just let Jesus fill them. Amen. Oh, my goodness, and it worked. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's just stay in prayer until the Spirit of God fills us. Fills us, because we're dry without Him. We need to be replenished. We need to be satiated, quenched. Dripping with the Spirit of God upon us. Amen? That is powerful. I tell you, if, if we could make a commitment like that to the covenant God and to the covenant community that He's creating, I believe it would look something like this that Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 12 and in the other Gospels. One of the scribes came to Him and heard them arguing and recognizing that He had answered them well, asked Him, What commandment is first and foremost? What commandment is first and foremost? Jesus said, the foremost is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall what? Love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. He doesn't first say you shall obey. You shall first fulfill all of his commandments. He says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. The second is like this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because if I love you, I want to do those things that benefit you. I want to do those things that bless you. I want to do those things that honor you. And out of that flow, the obedience chapters of 20 through 40. I believe that if we could live like that, that more communities would look like the early church in Jerusalem. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. There was addition. It doesn't even say that they did anything. They just loved on each other and shared the word of God. There was no ten revival meeting. They didn't construct new buildings. They didn't bring in a worship team. They didn't buy church bands. They just loved on people. They just loved on each other. And they worshipped the covenant of God. And God 
added to them about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to proper theology. And hermeneutic. no, it doesn't say. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Hermeneutics out the window. All the, the structures out the window. Apostles teach us what the Word of God says. That's what they were focused on. They didn't care about the little tangent stuff. They didn't care about all the little things. Teach us what the Word of God says. They were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And the breaking of bread is, is communion, the Lord's table. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Do we come to church that way? I wonder what God is going to do today. I wonder who God is going to bring in today. Do we come to church that way? Or do we come to church the way that, well, today's my day to volunteer. i got to make sure I'm there in time. <laughs> you know? Man, I'm praying. God, show up. Do something in at least one person's life. Let us know that you're part of this, God. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place with the apostles. And all those who believed had things together in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with, with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing in one mind. Unity, not uniformity, unity. We're in this together. We're in this for each other. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all of the people. The community was blessed because they were there. Well, those Christians, they're, they're crazy. Oh, man, they're good people. They're wacky. They meet at crazy times. They, they get up early, don't sleep in on Sundays. They, they, yeah, they, they, they're, they're crazy. But man, they're good people, aren't they? You just, you just, it's hard to find a bad thing to say about them. And that's what was going on. They were praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to the number, day by day, those who were being saved. Isn't that powerful? Yes. That's so powerful. I want to give you, very briefly, six things. And this is not a formula for revival. Please don't, don't thus say it, Andy, kind of thing. This is just, how do we experience Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 through 38? How do we experience that? How do we invite that guest into our presence, right? How do we invite that guest? There's six things. I think I put them all up on, on one slide for the note takers. The first is this, is that we have to decide to invite him in. Right? We have to decide to invite Jack. If I was going to have you over for dinner, I would, what would I have to do first? I would have to decide to invite you, right? Like I could when. <laughs> I could good too, buddy. <laughs> I feel a barbecue coming on. So we're going to use Jack for example today. So, so I have to decide to invite him in. Now why in the world would I decide to invite Jack in? Well, I enjoy his company. I think that we're both benefited by this fellowship. It's the same thing with God. I enjoy God's company. I think that I would benefit from God's fellowship. I have to first decide to invite him in. Because Jesus is not going to come and bust his way into our door of our lives and do what he wants. We have to invite him in. And that first is a decision to invite him in. So now I'm thinking, you know what? You know what? I really would like to invite Jack over. I think that'd be really, really cool to invite Jack over. We'd have a good time. And that's the end of it. I have to invite him, right? I have to invite him. I have to let him know with my lips that he was invited to my house. And it's the same thing with Jesus. We have to invite him in. And we do that primarily through prayer. We invite him in to our lives. Go ahead and take that step and invite Jesus into your life. Invite him in. God, come on over. We had we one friend, Gloria. She invited us over, and, and she, was, she was great. She would always pray this. She would say, Lord, give us good conversation. That's all. She had no agenda, but just give us good conversation. We'd go over there and visit. She's just a sweet lady. So we have to decide to invite him in, then we have to actually invite him in. And then the third thing is, we have to expect him to come. Right? What do you expect him to come? So, so uh, we're saying hypothetically, but Jack and I, I've given myself, you and LMA, we're going to have to set a date, okay? But let's say, uh, you like burgers? Yeah. Burgers, okay, so let's say I invite Jack and LMA over. We're going to have burgers. Jack's like, oh yeah, sure, okay, yeah, no problem, I'll be there. And I go out and I'm like, I like to grill, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy like five pounds of burger, right? I'm, I'm, we're going to make like monster burgers, we're gonna, this is going to be great, right? And I do all that stuff, 
and Jack and Ellie may never show up. You see, I bought that stuff because I actually expected him to show up. And it's the same thing when we come into to the church. When we invite Jesus into our presence, we have to expect him to actually show up. Amen. He intends to. If we just give lip service, just like we say, oh, I'll pray for you, and then never pray for you. Oh, Jesus, I invite you to my heart, but by the way, I'm still busy. I'll get to you later on. We have to expect him to show up in our lives. The third is this, or fourth is this. Be there when he shows up. Right? You can be there when he shows up. So I invite Jack and LMA. I got five pounds of hamburger. It's all formed in a patty. We're good to go. And then Beverly and I decide to go to Ithaca because I heard there's a great whatever going on up there. And Jack shows up and says, wow, where, where are the people? What, they, what happened? Elmay's like, I don't know, let's go to be with them. <laughs> what happens when there's two or three or four of us and we're here at like 9 o'clock in the morning and we're just praying that the Holy Spirit would be here and nobody shows up? You know? We, we and this is not a guilt trip, this is serious. This is how seriously we take the church. Somebody a long time ago paid for all of this. Somebody along the way has done, done right? <laughs> Somebody along the way has done a lot of maintenance to keep this thing going. We expect the Holy Spirit to be here, but, but we expect you as well. We're better together in community. And God expects us to be here when he shows up. Any one of us could read our Bible at home. David, you could read your Bible at home. There's no different words at home than there is here. But there's something different about the corporate body of Christ when we worship together, when we experience this together. I could, I could write out a check and mail it in. For me, it'd be a short trip. Right? <laughs> but I could mail it in, it would get there, the bills would be paid, whatever. I could turn on YouTube or whatever, and I could listen to whatever contemporary music thing is going on now, Bethel Hill song, whatever. I could do that. But something different happened. The Spirit of God is here. He's been waiting for us to show up. And we show up. And when we're here together as the ecclesia, as the living body, breathed into life, satiated with the Spirit, there's something you just can't get. Pre-recorded, amen? It's just different. The fifth is this. We need to make room for Him. Make room for Him. And I don't mean just like the, 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 the Jewish custom of leaving a seat for, I, I don't mean that, you know. I, I don't mean make physical, I mean make emotional room for him. <coughs> Leave the distractions behind. Make room for God and the changes that he desires to do in your life. And you're like, make that room. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? I've shared this story before. God really convicted me uh, years and years ago. It was 2005. God convicted me years and years ago. It's ancient history. Right? To some, it's ancient history. <laughs> 2005, God really convicted me, and he needed to spend more time, you know. And so I got up uh, 40 minutes early every day. So I'd get up a little after 5 every day, and I'd open up the hymnal, and I would sing a hymn very poorly and quietly to myself. <laughs> and then I would just get into the Word. And by the end of that 40 days, an hour wasn't enough, you know. I was getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning just so I could spend time with my Lord. I need to make room for him. And the sixth is this, is just spend time with him. Spend time with him. Spend that time in the Word and just stay there and just camp, I say this, you know, camp out on a scripture verse. Just camp out there and just stay there for a while and see what the Lord has for you, what message he has for you, what direction he has for your life. Spend time with God. Linger with God. Amen. So you've been gracious, and I, and I appreciate that little extra time this morning. I want to close in this. I want to, I want to say, let's pray. I think we have a slide for this. Go ahead and write it down. Let's pray that the Spirit of God would make us hungry for the presence of God in the person of Jesus. Amen? Because we don't realize how dry we are. Right? We don't realize that we need to be filled. We don't realize that yet. And so we have to pray that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, would make us hungry. Make us realize how dry and parched we are at the beginning of that desert, at the beginning of the journey, how dry and parched we are 
for the presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he will not disappoint. Amen? So let's pray. Father, your word is powerful. It's powerful and your glory fills places and people. It's so powerful. Father, help us to see and to feel and to realize and to know that we have been bought out of slavery. We don't even know how to live. We don't even know that we're dry and hungry and thirsty. We don't even know how broken we are. And so, Spirit, I pray that, that you would just minister wisdom and knowledge to me and help me, even me, to see how much I need the infilling of the presence of God in my life and help me to seek it through the person of Jesus Christ. He is on every page of Scripture. He is, he is just amazing. He is the risen Savior. He is living. He is praying right now for us. Father, help us to be hungry for that. And in you there is no lack. We will be, as the Scripture says, we will be filled. That the dryness will be quenched. The emptiness will be filled that we'll have new purpose and meaning and direction for our lives, that we will live kingdom lives, thriving kingdom lives for joy. We praise you and we thank you. And God's people said, Amen.